Hi, everybody. My name is officially Mel. I go by she, her. I am an independent official who is located on the East Coast, um, probably Northern East Coast, US. And I will be talking about intro to scorekeeping today. I hope you find this helpful and that you can either learn something new or get a refresher. I am going to be doing a PowerPoint presentation with some accents of being able to do some paperwork if people have additional questions. Uh, there will be some examples in the presentation. And if you have questions throughout, um, just post a note in the chat and I'll try to keep an eye on the chat as well. And we can go from there. Um, I am going to go ahead and get started with intro to scorekeeping. Here we go. Can you all see the presentation? Yep. Awesome. Get this so it's just me. All right, let's get going. Today, once again, is intro to scorekeeping. We are going to give a quick little update on how to do viewing side by side so that you're able to see the whole screen as um, my photo is over in the corner. What you wanna do is while viewing a shared screen, click on the view options up at the top and you choose specifically the side by side mode. The shared screen will appear on the left and the speaker will appear on the right. And you should be able to see the presentation as well as me. Another important thing is the disclaimer. All the information in the presentation, it's not endorsed by any other organization. Um, in order to remain consistent with the information that's provided by the WIFTA, a lot of the text and the examples have been pulled from WIFTA documents, but pretty much all the information presented here is current as of today date, today's date, but all the opinions are strictly my own. And just one more reminder that this is being recorded. Now, one of the things I wanna go through, and if you've seen some presentations of mine before, I do include this information, but I think it's important. There are helpful documents where you find all the information for officiating. And there are a bunch of them. There's the rules of flat track roller derby. Uh, the most recent update was just this year, January 1st, 2022. There uh, is the WIFTA stats book, there's officiating cues and codes and signals. There's a WIFTA uniform policy. If you look through all these documents, that's where you find the information. For example, you wouldn't necessarily know that NSOs must wear closed toed shoes unless you read the WIFTA uniform policy. So it's important to go through all these documents, the tournament games requirements, the regulation track layout, and um, of course, very important to know your risk management guidelines. Another thing that's important to do is make sure that you keep up with your officiating history document. You don't want to get three months down the road and be like, oh, what was that game I did last, you know, whatever month it was. If you keep up with it as you go, it's really easy to maintain what your games were that you have worked. And this is important, especially if you're ever interested in applying to tournaments or let's say you're applying to a new league, a game that's going on so that they know what sort of roles you have done. Other resources in education, you can find on the WUFTA site, there are things about the Roller Derby Certification Program for officials. There's additional officiating education for clinics and online learning. Um, there's actually a really great YouTube channel uh, run by Dublin Roller Derby. Brain of Terror does a series of kind of bite-sized versions of NSO um, details for paperwork and um, other information. That's a really great resource that I highly recommend. And of course, reach out to your established officials in your area. They'll be able to help you out. If they're like me, if you do derby, you like to talk about it. So reach out to people. I'm sure people are more than willing to help out and to um, give you some tips things that you might have find helpful in a game. But right now we're going to go into scorekeeping. Now the scorekeepers are the ones who keep track of the score tallies. 
um, and they keep track of the jammers and the pivots. And they pass that information onto the scoreboard operator in order to show the official score for the game. You wanna keep your eye out for the following signals. From the jam timers, you might hear five seconds. That's when they stand at the pivot line and they hold their hand up, five seconds. And then they do the tweet. Um, oops, it says jam start with an E. Um, but yeah, that's that's the jam start that you wanna be following. You wanna look for information from a ref or the jam timer about when a jam is ending. You'll get the tweet, 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 tweet. And then it is usually echoed by two more. Tweet, 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 tweet. Tweet, 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 tweet. It's that fourth of the first one. Tweet, 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 tweet. That's the end of your, um, like people can get points. It's the end of the jam, that fourth one. You wanna keep an eye also on whether there's a star pass. You'll see this signal. Not to be confused with this one. This one means the jam's calling off. Usually you see it from an OPR, but if you're getting one hand like this, that's signaling that there has been a complete star pass. You wanna keep track of that so that you can give that information to the scoreboard operator. Um, it's also important to make sure you keep it for your paperwork. Play stoppages, you wanna know team timeout, who takes it. You might wanna be aware if there's an official timeout or an official review. Um, a lot of times keeping some extra notes in the margin it's helpful for whoever's going to be doing your stats for the game, whether that's the head NSO or if there is a stats crew. Now, scorekeeper pregame responsibilities. One of the things you wanna do is you wanna make sure you meet your jammer rep. You're gonna discuss how you communicate during the game, whether there's added points, if there's a no earned pass. Um, for those of you who have been doing derby for a while, um, no earned pass, is, um, no pass, no penalty. Uh, the current term is no earned pass. It's for star passes, no initial pass, et cetera. Jammer refs, a lot of times they do something differently. You might see somebody hold up points one, two, three, or you might see one, two, three. Um, I know a jammer ref who does three, almost like an I love you in sign language. Um, it's just depending on how the jammer ref holds it up. You wanna be sure to be able to repeat that back to the jammer ref so everyone's on the same page. It will also be um, prior to the game where you will be set up with the team and the color that you'll be doing when you meet with your jammer ref. You're going to meet with your scoreboard operator and you're gonna discuss how you will communicate during the game. Um, I'm very chatty. I like a very chatty score table, you know, jammer out of the box, jammer's going to the box, pivot in the box. Um, you know, this is happening. This is a star pass. The more information I feel, the better, um, because that keeps everybody informed and on the same page. The other thing you want to do is you want to begin filling in the pre-game info. And by that, I mean, we're talking about the form header. It's very important that you put your name on it. Um, this way, somebody, if there's questions, they can go back to it. You can see that um, there is the scorekeeper and the jammer ref sections up at the top of your page. If the print in sheet does not already have it, also fill in the team names, the team colors, and the date. A lot of times if you're doing a game, this information will be in there, but if it is not, please go ahead and fill it out. Now there's all these columns and some of them are really, really tiny. Um, what do they all mean? You have the first column, which is which jam you're in. You only wanna do one at a time. You have the jammer's number. You have whether somebody's lost lead, whether they've gotten lead, whether they've called it off, whether it's been called off due to injury. And this is for anybody, whether it's a skater or if it's a ref, um, if it's called off due to injury, both sides mark this. So both team scorekeepers mark this. Also, you have no initial pass. Once you get to trip two, that's when you start counting the points. 
in the end. You've got jam total for that line. And then you've got the game total. Now jam number. What you're gonna do is you're gonna write the jam number at the beginning of each jam, starting at one each period. So this means like if it's at the beginning of the first period, you start at one. The second one, don't keep numbering it. You start once again at one. You do not want to write more than one jam number at a time because you may need to track a star pass. And we'll go over how you track that star pass a little bit later in the presentation. Overtime jams, they continue numbering, um, they continue the numbering of the second period. So if you're in the second period and you have a tie and you're going into an overtime jam and you've had 23 jams, the overtime jam is the 24th jam. Now the jammer number, you're gonna write the roster number of the jammer for that jam, for your team, obviously. And during a star pass, you write the roster number of your new jammer, which is the former pivot on the next line down. They give you a hint, it should have SP for star pass in the jam column when you have that switch if there's been a um, helmet cover pass during a star pass. Now during a star pass for the opposing team, you wanna leave the SP line blank and you're gonna add a little asterisk if it is an opposing team. And we'll go in a little bit more detail. I'll show you in the next one. Um, star passes. You are going to move down to the next line and you're gonna write an SP in the jam column. I've seen this a lot of different ways. Some people will put it in the margin. Some people will put it in the jammer number. You wanna put it in um, the jam in the jam column. You start tracking the rest of the jam in the new SP line. You can see here we have blue 125. They managed to get four points before they lose lead. Pivot turn jammer blue 50 is marked because you have the SP in that first jam column and S and 50 in the one after that. You start tracking in this third trip section for the new jammer, blue five zero. Right. Now, star passes for the other team. You're gonna move down to the next line and write SP in the jam column. You're gonna continue tracking the rest of the jam in your regional jam number row. You're not gonna mark anything in the SP row. And if you get to the end of the jam and the other team has the only star pass, that's when you add the asterisk to the SP right here. Does anybody have any particular questions about this? If you wanna speak up, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. If not, um, I'm gonna go ahead, go on, or you can just shoot a note into the chat and I'll make sure to address it. Can you, sure. um, before you move on, I just wanna read real quick. <laughs> I'm sorry, can you say that again? I missed it. Sorry, I was just saying, I just want to read it real quick before you move on. Oh, sure. So I don't have a question. I just wanted to catch up with reading the slide. No worries, no worries. Um, I do actually have a question. Sure. Uh, so for uh, what I've done in the past, and I just want to make sure this is kosher, rather than do the asterisk next to the SB, just because I write big, because I... Yeah, um, I just put a dash in where the numbers would go. Is that acceptable, like officially? Um, you want to do the asterisk because that's what you end up having to put into the um, the stats information. It lets the stats people or the head NSO who is doing the stats know that, yes, that was a star pass for the other team. Okay. Um, if you don't put any other information, I mean, by doing it the correct way, you know that they're going to um, do it. Yes, uh, we have a question. What if both teams have a star pass? I believe I'm gonna be going into that. Yes, next, that'll be the next slide. Are we okay to move on? Yes? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move on. Yes, thank you. Oh, no worries, no worries. Okay, so this is what happens when you have a star pass for both teams. You're gonna keep one SP tracking row. You wanna make sure that the star passes are the same for both teams. So 
the team who's tracking for blue and the team who's tracking for rest for red will have the same exact number of rows. Um, when you have a star pass for one team, and let's say um, blue has the star pass first, and they have lead, but then they lose lead right away, and they transfer their um, the star to blue five zero. Now at that point, that's when red puts the SP in that next line too. But for whatever reason, it looks like in this instance, uh, red 7253, maybe they got a penalty and so they, or they're stuck in the pack. They wanna pass off the thing because there's no, there's no lead jammer at this point anyway. So you might find yourself having two star passes. Um, in this particular instance, you're gonna keep it on the same line. And you will not have put the asterisk because you're going to be tracking your own star pass. And because there's the same number of rows, your stats person is going to be able to track that. You just want to make sure um, you can see here is red 7253. They have trip two, trip three, trip four. They get stuck. They pass it to their pivot. Pivot continues on with um, trip five and trip six. You want to keep this. You're going to count each one for each row. Uh, you just want to keep that straight. Um, if you're, so if your team that you were tracking also has a star pass for that jam, you move down to the next SP line, you continue tracking in the SP line for your team. So you have equivalent rows. Now, why do you mark it this way? Well, the asterisk shows your shows the scorekeeper didn't forget info. They didn't forget to move down their pivot. They didn't do any of that. And it's also for the stats book to calculate correctly. When you go to enter it into the stats book, you literally have to put a capital SP with an asterisk in there for it to, to fit and to make it even for each row. Now, if you've lost a lead, you're gonna mark an X if there is a lost lead or you've lost the ability to get lead. And you're not going to mark this if the jammer is eligible, but the other jammer may have already been declared lead. Um, if the other jammer's already been declared lead, there's you're not going to mark it. Um, there's a quick note here. It says, I have my score pe keepers just draw a quick five pointed star if the other team had a star pass. And then I don't have any confusion seeing SP if I don't make out the asterisk. All right. Um, I still think it's a good idea to make sure you learn that the SP asterisk gets add, added in there. Um, I'm not sure how somebody drew on my thing. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, but you do want to make sure that you put an SP on there with the asterisk if it's for the other team. see where we're at. Now, lead is lost or the ability to get lead is lost if the jammer removes their helmet cover after the start of the jam, but before lead is declared. Uh, let's say the jammer is declared lead, but they remove their helmet cover, commit a penalty or otherwise loses lead status. They lose lead if the jammer commits a penalty and goes to the penalty box before lead is declared. Uh, the jammer exists, um, exits the engagement zone at the end of the initial trip and the jammer referee signals not lead. That's usually when you get the jammer referee doing this signal here. Um, that usually means the jammer didn't pass everybody um, and earn a pass on everybody before they exited the engagement zone. And like I said, that's usually due to a no earn pass. Now for lost lead during an overtime jam, you have to leave it blank no matter what because neither jammer is eligible for lead in that overtime jam. They all, they all start earning um, points right out the bat and there's no lead declared in an overtime jam. Now the lead jammer, you're gonna mark an X if the jammer referee signals that the jammer is lead. That's why you can see this picture of Recordian holding her finger with an L. That's usually you get, you get them holding an L and they're pointing at the jammer. You can see how um, 
recordings doing that in the photo. Now, during an overtime jam, once again, there will be no lead jammer, and you're going to leave that blank. You're going to mark the column called off the jam with an X when your listed jammer successfully calls off the jam before the jam time ends. You're going to do this for every call off, whether or not the jammer called it off legally. So let's say you're on the blue team and for whatever reason, red manages to call off the jam. Red is going to be marking that column for calling off the jam. And I would recommend that both scorekeepers mark in their margin what happened there. Um, this will help kind of clarify why did blue mark lead, but red called it off. A little note in the margin can make a world of difference when you're trying to fill out the paperwork after the fact. Write anything weird in the margin. That's a good rule of thumb. Now, the injury column, if the jam is called for injury before the natural end of the jam, um, this applies to any injury that happens, no matter what position uh, the injured person is playing. And that, and that means like whichever team they're on. And it includes jams called for injured officials. And you can see with the red arrow here or with the red circle here, um, this is where you mark it off. This is that last um, second to last column there for injury. For no initial trip completed, you're going to mark an X if the jammer does not complete their initial trip by the end of the jam. And you're not going to enter any score in the trip to column. One of the things I see a lot on paperwork is they'll mark no initial jam, but in this next little section here, they'll put a zero. If you've marked this, there is no zero. The zero only gets added into this jam total column. There is no zero in the trip column. Does that make sense? Okay, would injury, in, I'm sorry, I see, I'm see. i seeing a note in the chat. It said, would the ING column, which is the injury column, include jams called off early by officials for other reasons like equipment malfunction? Um, no, because it's not an injury. Um, if there's equipment malfunction and the the jammer or one of the referees calls it dead because you know somebody's mouth guard fell out or you know all of a sudden somebody's wrist guard comes flying off um, or one of the things I've seen is you know those kneecaps on um, on the knee pads sometimes the cap will come off when there's something like that if it's not addressed immediately jam is called dead um, and that's just you mark in the in the margin what happened there and why it was called off. Now, no initial trip. This is one of those things where you want to make sure you touch base with your jammer ref to make sure that you know what they're talking about. Some people do no initial trip like this. Some people might have other some other kind of signal. You want to make sure that you and your jammer ref are on the same page with how you are signaling information. Now, in the columns for scoring trips, these are the trip two through 10. After the initial trip is complete, that's after they've gotten through the pack the first time and they're making it around the second time to go through that trip two, uh, you want to write the points for each scoring trip as the jammer referee signals them in the column for the appropriate trip. The next trip starts when the jammer exits the front of the engagement zone. And you're gonna write the points for any trip that has started, even for a zero point trip. Now, what this means is, let's say you have blue jammer one, two, five, and they've made it through the initial pass and they've made it through, um, all four blockers, but they haven't exited the engagement zone and they just get past the engagement zone and then they call it off. Usually that means that they're on the next trip. So you need to count that as a zero. Um, so you've gotten the four. A lot of times you'll see the jammer ref holding up the four points. Um, yes, I'll go through and I will define the engagement zone. There's a comment in the chat. I just want, I'll get back to that in one moment. Um, so you'll see a jammer ref hold up the four points. Now the people watching the watching the game, they won't know what it means if let's say the jammer gets through 
and the Jamboree is holding up that they got zero points, they're going to be like, they got four points. What happened? Um, so a lot of times what the Jamboree rep will do is they'll hold up the four points and just, you know, as additional information for the scorekeeper might bring it down like this. So it's four points. So everybody watching the game knows that yes, the jammer got four points, but they bring it back here. So four points back here. This helps you realize that yes, you have to add that extra zero. Um, and thanks Mark for adding that. Uh, the engagement zone is 20 feet in front of the foremost blocker in the pack and 20 feet behind the first, um, the first blocker in a pack. And that's what, in is the engagement zone. If you're in front of 20 feet, okay, here's your pack person. This is the for this most person. You can go 20 feet ahead of that. And once you hit that 20 feet in an inch, <laughs> that is your, you've exited the engagement zone. All right. Now, trip two through 10 scoring trips continue. During a star pass, the new jammer picks up on the trip where the original jammer left off. That's where we saw like the four is in the, the trip two column, but once it's passed to the pivot, who becomes the next jammer in the trip three, you kind of go down into the next column because they're on the next trip. So the new jammer picks up on the trip where the original jammer left off. So if you have marked points for a trip for the original jammer, when the new jammer scores, you write the points on the SP line under the next trip. That's where the two for the first one, the next trip is trip three. So that's where you add it there for under the pivot going through. You only write the points when the jammer re has signaled points at the end of the jammer's trip. You should mark all points scored on the scoring trip of a star pass for the new jammer. So that's where we were talking about where you have, um, you carry the, the points along each line. You always add up the jam, um, the jam total. It's the this, this second to last line here. This jam total is what you're adding up for every row. And we'll go into more detail about when we get to that, that section. Now, during an overtime jam, um, there aren't enough columns. You got to figure out how to do it. There's going to be some extra points if they make it through that first initial pass. There is no lead jammer and it's still technically in the beginning there. So what you're ending up doing is you're going to write the score for the first trip in the trip two column as such. You're going to put the initial trip points. So they make it through, they get four points. The second trip points, so the four points of the initial trip, which you don't usually have, and then you have the points of the second trip. You end up putting a four plus four all in that trip two column. Now, if you have more than nine scoring trips, if a jam has 10 or more scoring trips, you write them in the, 10, in the trip 10 column, as in um, that last one, just before you get to the jam total. You end up putting also four plus for, I've never seen this happen, but it's a possibility that it could happen. Um, maybe some of the officials who have been out there a little bit longer have seen that many trips. You gotta go be going pretty fast to be getting that many trips in two minutes. Um, but this is how you would mark it. You would mark it the four plus four just on the other end. Now the jam total. At the end of a jam, you're gonna write the total number of points scored during that jam. During a star pass, you add up the original jam number row and the SP line separately. And you write the jam totals on their respective rows. And what that means is if you have somebody, um, jammer one, two, three gets four points in trip two, and then they pass it to um, the pivot turn jammer five, zero, and you put, four points in trip three for five zero. You're gonna carry, one of them gets a four. You go along the SP line, that person gets a four and you're gonna add it accordingly in the um, game total column, which we'll be going through. Now, during a star pass for the opposing team, the jam total is gonna be zero. Nothing wrong with that. You just put a zero in that column. So there's something in every row. 
So you can kind of see it here. This is where it's um, showing how one, two, five gets this point, five, zero gets this point. You're gonna carry this four all the way across till you get to the jam total. Five, zero got seven points. So you're gonna carry that across and you're gonna put seven points in that jam total. You're gonna continue to add on here for the game total. All right, once again, noting that if there is a star path, nothing goes in that trip two column. You're just going to add the zero over here in the jam total. Now the game total, this is the running total of points for the game. You're gonna add the current jam total to the game total from the previous jam. During a star pass, you're gonna add the game total for the original jam number row and the SP line separately. And this is what we were talking about, carrying across the row. And you're gonna put the game totals on their respective rows. During a star pass for the opposing team, the game total for the SP line should be the same as the row above it. That's where you, just to go back, that's where you get the zero. It's just gonna be like, you know, 59 plus zero is 59. Now the period totals, jam total should be the total number of points scored in each individual jam of the period. And the game total should be the total number of points earned for the entire period. And so this is for period one, and that's going to be for period two. Oh, thanks, Mark. Um, Jeff has a hand up. Jeff, do you want to um, unmute and we can go from there? Just ask your question. I can't see all the hands. That's okay. I um, I would take us way back here to the to the actual star pass. Yeah. Just a little just a little clarification. Sure. Um. So if the original jammer uh, is on a trip, yeah. So let's say they get one point then yeah. can't get anywhere star passed and the new jammer gets three the new jammer is credited with all four points is that yes. correct in the absolutely new, and it's uh, considered once the, once the first jammer passes the star to the pivot as long as the pivot then continues and passes the other um the other three blockers they get right. the four points the new pivot does the original yes. jammer does not. You don't put a one and then a three in the bottom. Right. Okay. It's whoever completes the the trip who gets the point. That's that's who um, gets credit for it. Okay. The other weird thing is if let's say the jammer takes it off and passes it to the pivot over the rest of the jam the rest of the blockers and then the pivot takes off, mm -hmm. you don't get those extra three points. Correct. Yeah. Um yeah. please, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but you don't get those extra three points. You just get that one point for that pass. It's like right. um, it's like the Dorn pass, basically. Yes, yes, yes. Because you also, have to be wearing the star on the helmet in order to get the points when you pass the people. Yeah. Also, um, that was me. I don't know how I did it, but oh, I that's okay. on your screen. We now and, have a uh, lovely yellow mark I can't, on the screen. I, I, I tried to get rid of it. I didn't even believe it would show up for everyone to see, but I, I apologize. It's totally <laughs> fine. It's totally fine. Um, it looks like Mark's saying view options annotations. I'm not sure what that means. Mark, do you want to explain that? There's a little menu up at the top. And you as the host should be able to see it too. Um, it just says view options and then it has a drop down. And you can clear the annotations. It gives you there's a under the drop down annotate. And that'll oh, yeah. give you like this whole bar of things that you can Ooh. annotate with. Okay. And I can clear it. Mm -hmm. Clear all drawings. Viewers drawings. Let's do that one. There we go. Thank you, Mark. I learned something today. Yay. <laughs> Information for everybody. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go back to period totals. Um, once again, the, the period gets to the end of down here. You mark your, your number here. For the next period, you want to make sure for period two, your ending period one number goes right at the top. So if you have 157 points in the first game, you want to write 157 here. So then you continue your totals all the way through on your period two. All right, period totals. 
let's get all right now a note for the period totals and this is kind of what i was just saying after the period one the jam total and the game total they should be the same if you have 157 points both columns should read 157 points for period one and when you get to the end of the game the combined period one and the period two jam totals should match the final game total so it's just it's another check to make sure that you are adding correctly this is also helpful when you're talking to your scoreboard operator verify points after every every single jam after every trip you want to make sure you guys are on the same page if there's been 12 points and you have 15 but your scoreboard operator only has 12 and you haven't talked about it that's a problem so you want to make sure you're conversing back and forth um, so that you have that information accurately on the paperwork as well as in the official score total that's displayed for everybody to see now, um, yeah. do they, I'm sorry, it's hard for me to type right now. Do they keep track of the points like at the, like throughout the jam like we do, or do they get that total like at the end? No, they keep track of it. For every trip that goes by, you would say like blue plus four and your score board operator would plus four on it and it would automatically add it to the total on the official score that's projected. Um, awesome, thank you. Yeah. Okay, we have a question here. Uh, in my limited experience, scorekeepers compare notes and verify each other's papers and totals at the end of the period. Um, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll just make sure that the other scorekeeper had, and, and I have the same number of star passes. That's one of those things that a lot of times you'll miss one. Um, you just wanna make sure that you have the same number of columns and star passes is one of those uh, tricky little things that if you're missing it, it can really throw off um, like when someone's doing stats to see what's going on. Um, you won't have the same numbers otherwise with your other your other team's scorekeeper. Um, but you do have a jammer ref who would come up and verify the information that's on your sheet to make sure that yes, you do have everything right. And they go off and they do their thing. You can see in the photo um, that I have on the presentation, you can see the jammer ref coming over and there's a discussion with one of the scorekeepers. That's pretty common, especially if there's been a weird thing, like you might get a no earn pass like this. That means there's only three points. You wanna make sure that information is on there. Um, yes, and there's another note. It's very important um, to, oh, lots of notes. It's very important to total and confirm points quickly because the next jam begins and the score cannot be changed. Um, it's also a great idea to work out language with the scoreboard operator in advance to make sure that communication is smooth. In the, um, it's pretty standard to say color number points, blue one seven or, or blue plus four, red plus four, um, blue plus two. However, it works out. You want to make sure you, you have that, um, that worked out ahead of time so that there's no miscommunication between that. Uh, oh my gosh, there's a whole bunch of notes coming in here. Sorry, guys. Uh, a note also from Mark, a score can be fixed up to the end of the next jam, except for that last one. If there's like in the last period, it has to be started at the, um, it's at the beginning of the, the last jam that's gonna happen. And when recording star passes, do you have to keep record, record of the other team's passes? Yes. Um, that's where you have like the SP. And if it's the other team, you put the asterisk on it. Um, that's how you keep track. So you want to make sure you keep and track every single star pass that's going on, whether it's for your team or the opposite team. You don't want to put the opposite team's pivot number on your sheet. So if red has a star pass, but you're tracking for blue, you don't put red 452 on yours. You just put SP. And then if your team also does not have a star pass, you add the asterisk at the end. You just wanna make sure you have the same number of rows as everybody does. And if, let's say you miss one. It's not a horrible thing if you draw a line and put SP just so that the 
stats people know, okay, yeah, there was a star pass there. All right. Um, there's a note here from Andrew Miller says, yes, scoreboard can fix the points score after jam goes by. Just learn, actually, that's that's actually really kind of tricky. You have to like go into the rows underneath, but that's scoreboard. We're not worrying about this. This is intro to scorekeeping. Um, and we are gonna continue on because we've got about 15 minutes left, left for a couple more slides. And I would like a chance to get us into some Q and A. Everybody good so far? You can unmute and just say yes, so I know. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Great. Yep. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Excellent. So just one note for the halftime responsibilities. You're going to be switching sides, aka the teams, for the second half. So if you were blue for the first half, you're going to be switching to red for the second half. But you are going to still keep the same jammer rep. You just kind of move sides. You move your position to the other side of the scoreboard operator. And don't forget to write your name and the jammer ref's name on the period two sheet. Once again, this is very important. If there's any questions, you wanna be able to go back to the scorekeeper who had that information. Um, if, especially if both don't write down who did what, um, there's really, it just makes it tricky for whoever's doing stats. Now, end of game responsibilities. At the end of the game, the combined period one and period two jam totals should match the final game total. You can total the columns. Um, it's optional, but it's helpful. I like to do it just so that you can get the double check that yes, all these columns add up to this number and that's gonna equal the jam total. And then that's gonna equal the game total when you add it to the period one. Sounds really confusing. Basically, it just means you go down here and you add this column, and then you add this column, and then you add this column. And then it just kind of goes all the way to the edge there. You're gonna turn the paperwork to the designated location specified by the head NSO. Um, a lot of times that is the score table. So, you know, the people who are doing the penalty box are gonna bring it over to the score table. And whoever's doing the penalty lineup tracking is gonna bring it over to the score table. It's just like a centralized location. Um, I don't think I've ever done a game where it was somewhere other than the score table. Um, but that's one of the things. Oh, I just wanna make one more mention. If you are say on the blue team, you'll be given a little wristband that is blue <laughs> and your jammer ref is also gonna have a little blue wristband. This way, when you're holding up your points, you know, I've got four points or I've got three points. You have the matching. So you, you know visually, yes, the blue jammer ref has three points. I also have three points and I'm wearing the little blue wristband as well. Now, a couple of tips. Oh, a couple of tips that I like to do. Um, write out your numbers zero through nine at the bottom of the page. This can help when, let's say your four and your nine might kind of look alike. But if you write it down at the end of the, end of the page, you can see, okay, this is how the person writes their four. This is how the person writes their nine. And you can see the difference. It just helps your stats person. Now, if your jam runs a full two minutes, you've got blue got lead and then they lost lead. Jam's gonna be two minutes long. I always write two minutes in the margin. It just helps when you have a lead and let's say you accidentally forgot to mark that they lost lead because they got a penalty or whatever. If you have the two minutes there, it kind of shows, yes, they got lead, they lost the two minute jam. You wanna let the scoreboard operator know the running point total after every jam to ensure that the scoreboard is correct. Blue, um, blue plus four, blue plus three, total of seven, total of seven, total of seven. Yes, confirmed. Add it to your thing. They have the same information, next jam happens. Once you get the hang of the basic scorekeeping, there's this really awesome system called the DOT system. Um, this is just like an added extra way of tallying and including information. You know that when the jam starts, you put a period in that column, you can kind of see it in this section here. Um, but that's another class. 
if you want to attend that one, that'll probably be after the new year. Um, I have a feeling not a lot of people are going to want to attend stuff in Jan in uh, December. So things just get really hectic at the end of the year. Uh, so I'll be doing another couple in January and probably into February. Um, and one of the things we'll be going over is the DOT system. If you have any questions, if you are interested in more information, please feel free, feel free to email me at any time. Um, this is my email address. This is my Derby email address, officially mel576 at gmail.com. Um, please feel free to email me um, if you have anything else. Uh, Thank you for coming. I really appreciate your time and I appreciate everybody uh, taking time out of their night or in some cases morning, because I know some people are overseas. Um, I appreciate you coming out. Does anybody, uh, I'm sorry, there's one more question here. Somebody says, I find writing the pivot number in the margin helpful, then I don't need to find that number on the track for a star path. Yes, that is actually very helpful. That's actually one of the things that go through with the um, dot system. I don't think it's an official part of the dot system, but just tallying that really, really helps, especially if, let's say you're doing paperwork for penalty lineup tracking and things got hectic and it was a quick jam and you know whatever happens and somebody happens to miss one team or the other happens to miss the pivot. If you have that secondary information, that's why we have so much paperwork going on. Um, because if you have that secondary place um, that that um, has the information, you don't have to go back and rewatch the video of the presentation uh, of the game. Let's see. Um, oh, thank you. There's a note here. Um, do you have a Venmo or PayPal we can use to send you a donation? Um, I really appreciate that. I actually do. I will be posting it on the YouTube channel. Um, but I also ask if you have local juniors teams, support the juniors teams. Um, if you're going to throw anything in there, junior teams are the Derby, the adult leagues of the future. Um, I'm working with a whole bunch of officials out here who are juniors, who are just fantastic, trying to get the information. And um, so if you have local juniors teams, I happen to work with um, the Monadnock Junior Team, as well as the Skatriots, the New England Skatriots. Um, if you want to send something their way, that's great too. Um, I certainly spend a lot of time on these presentations, so I do appreciate um, if you guys want to throw anything away to my <laughs> Derby Travel Fund, because um, as you know, traveling for Derby isn't cheap. Um, one more thing. This also helps head on us have another spot to put. Yeah. Um, Andrew is saying that when you do write the pivots in the margin, it's just one more place to have that information. That's kind of what I was saying about, you know, if somebody happens to miss it, somebody else caught it. So does anybody have any more questions? Um, I'm happy to answer them. I am going to go ahead and stop recording. Um, but I'm happy to stay on and people can ask questions. Or um, I will be posting my YouTube channel onto the event link. That way you can find the information. It is a brand new YouTube channel. So there's going to be one video on there right now, which is just for the penalty box one that I did um, just the other week. I will be adding, yes, definitely, please like and subscribe. Uh, you'll get notices every time a video is added. I am planning on um, doing several more, just so you know, I have a penalty lineup tracking one coming up next week. Um, I am going to be doing an, a very, very, very high level intro to Derby uh, one in January. Um, it's really more like if you don't know anything about Derby, you know, your great aunt Sally wants to come to a game but has no idea what Derby is. This is that's the kind of presentation um, you're going to want to see for that. I will also be doing a very high level rules discussion um, that will basically go through. Well, high level rules, it's not going to go into minutia, it's not going to go into the really tricky situations, but it's just to give people an idea like what's a target zone, that kind of thing. And then I will be doing 
a dot system presentation as well as a um, like a advanced jammer swaps. And then go from there and see what happens. Um, I'm saying I'm a lot because we're at the end. <laughs> Mel, I have a question just yes. to confirm I understood correctly for scorekeeping, we wear black? Yes. Um, the uniform for doing any NSO rules is a black top. Uh, generally, you want to have black pants too and closed toed shoes. You do not, you, if you are wearing flip flops, you can't do it. It's part of the risk management guideline um, and part of the uniform. If you happen to have additional things, like you can see my official email, that's on, um, I might be switched on that side, but it's on the right side of my chest. Um, you can put your name there. You can put your uh, pronouns there. A lot of times you'll have like a patch on the other side. Like if you have a woofed patch on the back, it says official. Those are not mandatory. It's just nice um, to be able to have that information on there. I am going to go ahead and um, stop sharing at this point. I am going to also stop recording. So. Just to sign off, thank you everybody for coming to the presentation. I am going to sign off now and we will open it up to discussion. If people wanna stick around, great. If not, that's totally fine too. Um, thank you very much. Let's stop here. Pause, uh, stop recording. All right, thank you everybody.